thank you for taking the time to visit Strongbow's website and take a look at our corporate presentation. I'm Richard Williams, the CEO of Strongbow, and I'm going to run you through our plans for the South Crofty Tin Project in the UK. As an overview to the company and the project, we've recently published the findings from a preliminary economic assessment that was conducted by P&D Mining Consultants from Ontario. Currently, we own 100% of the project in the UK. Within the group itself, Cisco Gold Royalties is our largest shareholder, owning approximately 24% of the issued capital of the company. Uh, since we acquired the project in July 2016, uh, we've published a new NI43101 mineral resource estimate, which shows that the South Crofty Tin Project is one of the highest grade tin projects globally, and we believe there's excellent potential to expand upon that resource. In addition to that, the project comes with a valid mining license that's valid until 2071, and also planning permission to build a new process plant on the site uh, in the town of Poole, Cornwall. As mentioned earlier, we recently published a PEA study and the outcomes of that based on a $10 a pound tin price and a 5% discount rate is that we have a project that has an after-tax net present value of around 130 million US with an internal rate of return after tax of just over 23%. Uh, so this is an excellent start for the project and the next steps for us are to advance the project to a production decision. A little bit about Strongbow. Uh, the company has been around a while. It was it was restructured in 2015, uh, bringing in a Cisco Gold Royalties as a strategic partner to identify and acquire high quality tin tungsten projects uh, in a market and commodities that were overlooked and could be acquired at low cost to the company. After looking at numerous projects, uh, what stood out about South Crofty was the jurisdiction, uh, the mining history on the project and the fact that we've got this mining license in place that's valid for another 54 years and clearly one of the issues facing the mining industry today is the permit risk and the time it can take to get mining licenses approved. Uh, we are currently listed on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol SBW. In addition to the South Crofty project, we have a number of other projects in, in Canada uh, which are either at an earlier stage. For example, we have two tin projects in Alaska uh, which have initial drilling on them but are not at the stage where we can publish a 43101 resource estimate. And we also have a nickel project in northern Canada, a new discovery that does have a, a 43101 resource estimate estimate on it, uh, but it's not the focus for the company currently. Why tin? We've looked at the tin market and we feel that we're going into a period with supply deficit and corresponding growth in price. And we've seen that over the course of 2016, where tin bottomed at just over $13,000 a ton in January 2016. And by the end of 2016, it almost touched $22,000 a ton or $10 a pound. Uh, the projections for the next four to five years through groups like ITRI, uh, the International Tin Research Institute, are for continued deficit of supply to the market and corresponding growth in the price with predictions uh, anywhere from 20 $2,000 a ton up to twenty-five or even $30,000 a ton. Uh, so we see the timing in the market uh, as being perfect for getting the South Crofty project back towards a production decision. Today we have just over 60 million shares issued, trading at around 15 cents Canadian uh, with a market cap just over $8 million. And just to recap, uh, our biggest shareholder, Cisco Gold Royal, has been a very strong supporter of the company, participated in every financing so far and uh, continues to support the progress at South Crofty. Aside from that, management directors also own just over 13% of the issued capital. Management directors, uh, Gren Thomas was the founder of the company. He's our chairman. Uh, Gren, very well known in Canadian mining circles. He's a member of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame through his role in the discovery of the Divic mine in his previous company, Ava Resources. Uh, John Bajinski represents Osisco Gold Royalties on the board. Obviously, Osisco's success developing the Malartic mine and selling it in 2013 led to John becoming one of the Osisco Group's uh, Mining Man of the Year 2009, also Prospect of the Year in 2007. John is currently CEO of Cisco Mining uh, with a very exciting new discovery called Windfall in Eastern Canada. Patrick Anderson joined the board in September 2016. Patrick's previous success obviously discovering the Fruta del Norte gold project in Ecuador and more recently advancing Dalradian's Kurganalp gold project in Northern Ireland to a production decision. 
Ron Netlitsky, another member of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, currently director of Skeena Resources, uh, but has also been involved with numerous discoveries in Western Canada, which have subsequently become mines. And lastly, Ken Armstrong, uh, former CEO of Strongbow and currently CEO of North Arrow Minerals, uh, rounds out the board. Uh, Zara Bolt is our Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Zara has worked with the group over the last 10 to 15 years. More recently, was Chief Financial Officer of Kamenak Gold, which was acquired by Gold Corp earlier this year. And before that, was Chief Financial Officer of Stornoway Diamonds. And based in the UK, we have Owen Mylop, who is our Chief operating officer. Owen's a mining engineer based in Cornwall and is looking after the day-to-day details and uh, project management at South Crofty. This slide is a very interesting image of what the South Crofty mine area used to look like in the late 1890s. Uh, Clearly it represents a very active and vibrant mining district. Uh, That today is the town of Poole and Camborne and is also the site of our South Crofty project and on the far right hand side of that photograph uh, that would be the area that's been set aside by Cornwall Council for the construction of the new process plant. I think it's important to understand the history of South Crofty and why we think it's a very viable project to advance forward from here. Uh, In 1985, the tin price collapsed with a flood of new tin coming out of Southeast Asia, Malaysia in particular, with the discovery of cheap to mine, easy to access alluvial tin deposits. This led to the demise of the Cornish tin mining industry and the last mine to close in Cornwall was South Crofty in 1998. In 2001, a company called Base Result Holdings picked up the project and announced that it was going to push ahead to try to get the mine back into production, but was met with fairly strong opposition from groups like the Southwest Regional Development Authority that was opposed to uh, restarting the mine. This led to a period of years where Base Result and then subsequently Western United Mines fought a legal battle to preserve the rights of the mine. Um, in 2007, brought in a group called Galena Asset Management as a significant investor, and then in 2011, formed a joint venture with Celeste Copper. Between Western United Mines and Celeste, there was somewhere in the order of 25 to 30 million pounds spent on the project, developing a decline, uh, drilling off a new near-surface polymetallic resource, applying for the new mining permit, and also working through the planning permission for a new process plant. Unfortunately for that joint venture, by the time the mining permit was granted in 2013, it also coincided with one of the worst bear markets that people in the resource business uh, can remember. As a result of that, Celeste Copper defaulted on their obligations as a joint venture partner and the project was put into bankruptcy protection or administration in the UK. That's where Strongbow enters the equation. Uh, We looked at the project in late 2015, uh, restructured or negotiated a deal with with Galena and the unsecured creditors within the company and were successful in acquiring the project and getting TSX Venture Exchange approval for the deal in July 2016. As a result of that, now we have a project that's got a new 43101 mineral resource estimate. It's got a mine permit. It's got planning permission, and the one thing that we are working towards now that would then make the project fully permitted is to apply for and secure a mine water discharge permit, uh, which is a process that's ongoing. I think the main thing to get across from all of this is that the UK is open for business. There are, especially in the resource sector, there are other projects like Dalradian's Gold Project in Northern Ireland and Sirius Minerals project in Yorkshire, uh, which are having very strong local support, community support, uh, to generate new jobs in areas that are familiar with mining activity historically. The project is located in Cornwall, in the far southwest part of England. It's it's about a 465 kilometre drive from London down to Cornwall, or a four and a half hour train ride. The area is served by excellent infrastructure, power, roads, rail, crossing the project area. There is a familiar Uh, or a familiarity with mining in the region. Obviously the Cornish mining history dates back hundreds of years. The local communities are are very keen to see uh, the mining activity get going again in this area. South Crofty stands out because of the size of the deposit itself. Uh, Individual loads have been mined over strike lengths of up to five kilometres. Historic production started around 1700 and the region itself, the central mining district within Cornwall, which comprises South Crofty and the surrounding mines, has produced over 400,000 tonnes of tin metal. 
The 43101 resource that we published last year has two components to it, an upper mine which comprises copper, zinc and tin, and a lower mine which is tin only, and that would be the initial focus for us. The tin only resource averages around 1.8% tin under the indicated category, and around 1.9% tin under the inferred category which at today's prices represents something close to the equivalent of a 10 gram per tonne gold deposit or a 6 to 7% copper resource. Just to summarise the PEA findings, again the base assumptions for the economic assessment was to use $10 per pound tin price and a 5% discount rate. The pre-tax NPV for the project is around 165 million US, after-tax NPV around 130 million US with a an internal rate of return of just over 23% and a payback of 3.8 years. The initial mine life is an eight-year period where we're looking at peak production of around 1,000 tonnes per day and a life of mine average grade of just over 1.5% tin equivalent. The last two years of the mine life envisaged under the PEA study would be exploit in the near surface copper zinc tin resources, but the thing that really attracts us to this project is the potential to keep extending and add into the deeper lower mine tin only resource. The next slide is a Google image that shows the towns of Hool, Cambone that are enclosed within that red outlined area. The red outline represents the underground mine permission area, which covers an area of about 1,490 hectares. The blue outlined area in the centre of the underground mine permissions represents the area that's been set aside by Cornwall Council for the construction of the new process plant. The yellow line running through the project is the main A30 highway that comes down from London to, to Penzance and the black line that runs through the southern part of the property is the railway line that again runs from London down to Penzance. In the far top left corner of this image you can see the coastline, the Cornish coastline. So we're about three and a half to four and a half kilometres south of the coastal areas. Within the underground mine permissions area there were 26 former operating mines. Uh, they're all represented by the different colours on this image. And bisecting the centre of the property, the dashed red line is a structure known as the Great Cross Coast Fault. Historically, the bulk of tin mining occurred to the right or to the east side of that Great Cross Coast structure, which represented a structural barrier to progress further west. Uh, very often, getting close to the Great Cross Coast would end up getting into bad ground conditions or water inflow in the workings, uh, and that prevented tin mining activity extending west. So it's the western areas in the property that we see the potential to add significantly to the lower mine tin only resource. The largest and highest grade mine in the region was the Dolkoth mine which is shown in red there on that same image. Uh, Dolkoth was mined to a depth of a kilometre below surface. Uh, some of the load widths here were up to 20 metres wide and the mine's average grade was over 2% tin. Uh, so again, that supports our theory that the tin mineralization continues west and that's where the upside exploration potential exists. The next slide shows some of the infrastructure that we've also inherited as part of the deal. Uh, the four blue circles here numbered one, two, three, four shafts that have been preserved for future use. Uh, number one, the Williams shaft is the deepest shaft in Cornwall. It's over 900 metres deep and almost 6 metres diameter. That was sunk in between 1890 and 1910 to access the deeper levels of the Dolkoth mine. And we envisage utilising that shaft uh, in the future to link up to the Roskia shaft further to the north, number two. And that would provide a deep level haulage way on the west side of the Great Cross Coast Fault for the exploration upside that we, we see on, on the west side of the Cross Coast Fault. Initial mining under the PEA study would take place through the New Cook's Kitchen shaft or NCK, which is number three and just outside of the area that's been set aside for the new process plant. New Cook's Kitchen was in operation until the mine shut down in 1998. Uh, it was refurbished during that period and uh, will be part of the plan for initially dewatering the mine, getting access to the upper levels and completing a feasibility study on the project. The next slide just shows where the current resources are located and the breakdown between the lower mine and the upper mine resources. As mentioned earlier, the lower mine has an indicated resource grade of just over 1.8% tin and an inferred grade of around 1.9% tin. The upper mine is a composition of copper, zinc and tin and represented as a tin equivalent grade. Uh, I won't get into the details here, but you can see how the calculation is based in some of the text beneath the summary of the resource grades there.
The next slide just shows where South Crofty ranks on a global scale compared to other projects that are either in development or in production. The lower tin only resource with an average grade of between 1.8 and 1.9% depending on the resource category ranks South Crofty as, as number three on the list. Both Minsur's San Rafael and Metals X's Renison Bell Mines are in production currently. Alphamin Resources with the BISI project in DRC is currently in development and the balance or the rest of those projects shown on that table are in the development stage but clearly quite a bit lower grade than represented by South Crofty. Through the studies that we've done over the last year and uh, previous operators, we've identified what we believe is the exploration potential west and east of the Great Cross Coast Fault and you can see in summary here the total exploration potential in and around existing infrastructure within the mine represents anything in the order of 17 to 21 million tonnes of potential resources and that's what has attracted us to the project in addition to the current resource. Just to demonstrate that potential, this is an isometric view of the old Dogcoth mine, which is shown in the solid yellow on the left side of, of this image. The brown blocks and behind that the green and yellow blocks represent the upside potential. There's been very little to no drilling in these areas. Uh, typically the historic mining was on load development and mining what they encountered on those loads. Uh, so excellent upside potential here to add to the resource in and around the Dol Coth area. Uh, also further to the north, in and around the north and south Ross skier loads, these were mined in the 90s. The last blast to take place at the Ross skier load was actually mining uh, very high grade tin in excess of 10% tin. The area at the top of that image shown by the blue and yellow lines represents areas that were mined for the polymetallic mineralization historically. And at the bottom side of that image, the light blue and, and red shaded areas represent the areas that were mined in the 90s. The yellow solid blocks represent the upside potential and assuming continuation of mineralization from the bottom shaded areas up to the blue lines at the top of that image, if that's mineralized that represents another three plus million tons that can be added to the current resource base. So moving on to the uh, water issue which is the really the last permit that we need to have a fully permitted project. Currently the mine is flooded. Mine water discharges through an adit called Ross Crogan, which is shown on this on this map, directly into the Red River. Uh, what we've proposed is that we would install a water treatment plant. Uh, we would pump the water from the mine and discharge treated water, uh, obviously a much higher quality than is currently entering the Red River. And this would be a, a major environmental boost or a positive impact to the surrounding areas. Also the water treatment plant, if and when it's built, would be something that would survive the mine and allow local authorities to continue to keep mine water below added level, treat the water and make sure that uh, we can maintain a higher quality of environment around the old mine workings. This is not the first time that anybody's put in a water treatment plant in the region. There is a water treatment plant at the nearby Wheel Jane mine which has been in operation for the last 15 years successfully treating similar mine water to uh, what we have at South Crofty. So we started uh, water treatment trials in November last year. We've just announced that we've completed the water treatment trials and the work that we've done has successfully met targets that have been set by the UK Environment Agency. The next step for us is to submit a, an application for a full discharge permit, uh, which we expect to submit within the next month. And from there, we expect the turnaround from the Environment Agency to be a four-month period. Uh, so from our side, we are looking to have a discharge permit issued to Strongbow before the end of this summer. Uh, following that, we'll be in the process of constructing a new water treatment facility which would have a capacity of treating up to 25,000 cubic meters of water a day and that would allow us to fully dewater the mine over an 18 month to two year period. The process that we use is basically to add hydrogen peroxide that helps to precipitate arsenic from the water. Uh, lime dosing increases the pH of the water to above 10 which allows other metals to come out of solution. 
We pass that high pH water through a high density slurry, which adsorbs a lot of these metal ions, brings them out of solution. Then we add a flocculant. That flocculant settles in a lamella settling tank, and the sludge is then discharged or disposed of at a nearby tailings facility. Uh, that will happen through the mine dewatering process, and if and when we get into a production situation, the sludge from the dewatering process would be mixed with tailings and discharged back underground. Just a quick look at the current tin market. Over the last 100 years, there have been three periods of growth in the use of tin. Currently, the global consumption is around 300, 350,000 tonnes of tin per year. And the recent growth has all been related to the use of lead-free solder in high-tech electronics. So anything with a circuit board, computer, dishwasher, TV, um, has some level of tin solder within that. So mainly an electronics use and almost 50% of global use goes into high-tech electronics. From a visible stock supply, um, up until the mid-1980s, the U.S. used to maintain a strategic stockpile of tin. The U.S. has never had any domestic production of tin, so maintained that stockpile for domestic use. After the discovery and flood of new tin coming out of Southeast Asia in in the mid-1980s, the U.S. took the decision to sell off its strategic stockpile, and you can see that displayed here on this bar chart, where the grey bars represent the U.S. stockpile and the drawdown over the last 30 years to a point where it's currently at its lowest level ever. So visible stocks for tin are at recent historic lows, and as a result of that, the International Tin Research Institute, a group known as ITRI based in the UK, are projecting a deficit of supply into the market. There's been reductions in production from Peru, China, Indonesia and Africa over the last couple of years, and if that continues, then we could see a strong growth in the tin price between now and 2020. This slide is a conceptual diagram of what the process plant would look like. Um, So it's situated adjacent to the railway line. It's in a light industrial park. There will be a process plant capable of treating up to 1,000 tonnes per day from underground. The attraction of this project to the local community is that the footprint will be very small. Due to the availability of up to 8 million cubic metres of void space underground, uh, we do not need to permit a surface tailings pond. We will put the tailings back underground as paste backfill. Also the existing shafts will be connected to a decline that was installed through the 90s and also more recently uh, by Western United Mines and Celeste Copper. That decline will be connected up to the New Cook's Kitchen shaft so any ore hoisted from underground would be conveyed from the shaft through an adit straight up the decline into the process plant so there wouldn't be any trucks driving through town either. So the impact on the local community would be minimal. So just to summarise what we've achieved in the last nine months since we acquired the project, uh, we published a new resource statement last year. Uh, We successfully negotiated the exit from administration and got TSX Venture Exchange approval in July 2016. We commenced the water treatment trials in November last year and just completed them in the last week at the end of March. And the next steps for us are to apply for a full discharge permit. We have complete surface planning consents to construct a new process plant and we've got a mine permit that's now in good standing for another 54 years. Our objectives for 2017, we've recently filed and published a new preliminary economic assessment. We've completed the water treatment trials and we will be submitting an application for a full water discharge permit within the next month and we hope to receive that permit by the end of summer this year. Uh, In addition to that, we are planning some new uh, drill programs to test targets west of the Great Cross Coast to demonstrate that the upside potential that we've recognised is is real. And then hopefully towards the end of this year, we'll we'll be close to constructing the water treatment plant uh, with a view of starting the dewatering process in Q1 2018. This last slide just summarises milestone payments that Strongbow will make to Galena and Tinshield in return for Galena foregoing its secured creditor status and allowing Strongbow to acquire the project from administration. The main payment is payable upon Strongbow making a production decision whereby a payment equivalent to 25% of the net present value of the project is payable uh, to both Galena and Tinshield. In the event that Strongbow's market cap is less than the NPV of the project, then the payment would be the equivalent of 25% of Strongbow's Strongbow's market cap, with the balance payable to Galena and Tinshield 
as a 5% net profits interest after we've recovered our investment then from production profits. That brings the presentation to a close. Uh, thank you for taking the time to look into Strongbow as a potential investment opportunity and welcome you to contact the company if you have any further inquiries. Thank you.